We see the emergence of plant-based as a new concept, but as that soy-based products, amongst others, are deeply rooted in Asian culture, there is a lineage and connection to an ancient format of plant proteins. In America, one of the original progenitors, tofurkey, that has led the way since the 80s, has become more popular as it innovates towards the future. This is fascinating, particularly because they have also helped found the Plant-Based Foods Association, which is contributing to the knowledge base and commerce of companies that ostensibly they are in competition with. It goes to show you that there is enough to go around given the newfound popularity of this genre of protein. Today we will be speaking with Jamie Athos, President and CEO of Tofurky. Tofurky has been around since 1980 and they are one of the most iconic companies in the plant-based industry. We're very excited to have them as a bronze sponsor of the Alternative Protein Show. And just a little background on Jamie, he has a PhD in neurobiology from the University of Washington. He took the helm as president and CEO of Tofurky, his family's business, in 2005, and he's also one of the founding board members and president of the Plant-Based Foods Association. Hey everyone, we're here with Jamie Athos, president and CEO of Tofurky, along with Aaron Ransom, director of marketing of Tofurky. How are you guys doing today? Uh, we're great. Great to have you. Awesome. Thanks for inviting us on. And uh, I wanted to correct you. Uh, actually, Aaron is our VP of marketing now. That's nice. brand new as of just a couple of days ago. Oh, that's, that's super cool. Congratulations. Thanks. Well, when we, when we talked to her before, we thought that she should be VP as well. So <laughs> glad that you took our recommendation to heart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. That was a big part of our decision making, definitely, was your opinion. <laughs> So you all are in Hood River, Oregon, right? That's correct. Yeah. We're in lovely Northwest New Jersey. <laughs> so maybe sort of similar bucolic states of, of being? Well, you know, actually where we are is not too bad. It's in Hackettstown, and there's it's, qu it's quite pastoral in certain areas. It doesn't suffer from the usual, you know, connotations of New Jersey being right by the city and industrialized and smokestacking. So we've got cows and things like that. Oh, that sounds great. Very familiar. Yeah. Yes. yes. Sure. So I wanted to just kind of start giving a context in, in looking around at Tofurky's site and things. I noticed that you started in the 80s and that your founder, Seth Tibbet, who is a self-professed naturalist and hippie, started a toy around with fermenting tempeh. So the first question is, is why tempeh? Yeah, so Seth's story really... Um kind of his entrepreneurial story was a personal story. I think all of, you know, the best um, kind of entrepreneurial uh, ideas come out of kind of human experience and identifying needs in your own lives or, or others' lives. So Seth was, um, like you said, he was a self-described hippie. And part of that was evaluating what he was eating and what the impacts of what he was eating were on the planet. And he, you know, became a vegetarian. And like many people, who just become vegetarian, they kind of explore, like, how are they going to meet their nutritional needs and also have tasty, good food. And in that process, Seth came across a, uh, a traditional soy food from Indonesia called tempeh. And uh, tempeh was something that you could make yourself. It's a cultured, like a fermented uh, food. So he sent away for packets of the starter to make this tempeh, made some for himself and really liked it. And his, uh, his friends started asking him to, you know, make tempeh for them as well. And pretty soon the demand was uh, apparent that you, this could be a business. He could sell this instead of giving it away. And that was sort of the origin of what at that time was called Turtle Island Foods. And uh, he named the company after a book of poetry by a Zen poet. Um, and that book of poetry is called you know, Turtle Island. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of like that in, initial name. It didn't catch on quite like Tofurky did, but it's sort of a reference to uh, it's a Native American story. Uh, when Crow was flying around the world, he had nowhere to land, and tr the turtle offered up his shell to, to Crow, um, and we all live on the back of that turtle. That's kind of the, the mythology for where the origin of the North American 
uh, continent is. And you just kind of that spirit of helping one another and collaboration, I think, you know, that's kind of how I think Seth saw the world as, you know, he, he saw opportunity for him to influence it for the better. And he sort of set his kind of whole life's work, his whole goal um, towards doing that. And, and it really caught on to a degree that I don't think he realized it would. And really, you know, the the big marker of success or the big sort of milestone was uh, coming up with the Tofurky product and the Tofurky brand. And that happened later in 1995. Hmm. Wow. So that was kind of a confluence of his spirituality, really, and, you know, putting mm-hmm. into practice a desire to find a better way to be. Yeah, I feel like, you know, that's common. All of us are sort of striving to be better people, I think. You know, I'm an, I guess I'm an optimist. I believe that that's people's goals. Um, and, it, you know, some of us are better at, than, at it than others. And I think Seth is one of those people. He just had this natural instinct for kind of, a, you know, what the possibility, the potential of humanity was. And I think that's a really beautiful vision to have. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, so... I understand that you have a PhD in neuroscience and when you were asked to take the lead of Mm -hmm. Tofurky, um, this must have changed your plans. I mean, did it? Uh, Yeah. If you had asked me, well, a little more than 15 years ago, because I think I've been here at Tofurky for almost 15 years, um, I would have told you with great certainty that my future was not here at the helm of Tofurky. It was absolutely going to be in um, some sort of academic setting, a research scientist. And that's what I'd sort of trained to be my whole life up until that point. Um, But I also, my goal with being a scientist was to kind of, you know, better humanity also. I assumed it would be something like, you know, helping discover drugs that would treat Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or something like that. But when this opportunity came up, when my family's company was doing really well and needing, you know, help uh, managing it, I saw the potential to do good in a different way, but also to feel more of an immediate impact with my efforts. You know, the beautiful thing about science is it kind of grinds its way along and and gets to the truth, but it's also a slow process. And I felt like um, it wasn't satisfying to me seeing that slow progress. And Tofurky, on the other hand, was a chance to have a really immediate impact. You can see you know, the numbers of of units of product you're shipping going up every day. You can, you know, come up with new products that are successful. Um, And also, we have this special connection with our customers. Um, You know, they really uh, love our brand and we love them back. And it's that personal relationship that we have is really gratifying too. People let us know how important, you know, our products have been, how important our company has been in their own lives and in their own transitions to, you know, living a, a, a better way, a more sustainable way. Right. And I'm sure being a neuroscientist must, you know, better inform you really um, as CEO, um, especially in this, you know, field that's really growing, both in science and innovation. Um, I'm, a, I'm sure that's a big part of how you're able to help. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely came in as sort of, you know, an in-house technical expert, I guess. You know, I've had to learn a lot of what I know about food science um, on the job, but I think the process was always there. I always understood the scientific method really well. And I think that uh-huh. definitely does uh, pay dividends. It, it, it definitely informs my decision-making process every day and in every way. Um, but, you know, that's definitely been something that's been gratifying and interesting to me also is, is all the interesting food tech that's coming out, different you know, processing methods and different ingredients that are coming online all the time. I think this um, kind of upswell and in interest in plant-based foods has just really ignited this whole industry or created this whole industry around, wow, how can we make products even better, you know, even faster, even cheaper? Um, and ultimately, this is all benefiting the consumers and the consumers want more plant-based foods. So it's great that we're all kind of, you know, gearing up together and in concert to, to meet that demand. Absolutely. I mean, there's really great potential in, you know, plant-based protein. I know there's a ton of research too, that, you know, still needs to be done for all the potential that exists, of course. Um, you know, maybe, can you speak on that a little bit? Um, yeah, yeah. So I think that we're all striving, you know, definitely the mission of Tofurky is that we're striving to make it really easy for consumers, for our customers to make better decisions about what they eat. 
Um, they might be motivated by a lot of different things. Maybe it's concern over the environment. Maybe it's concern over their you know, personal health, or maybe it's concern over animal welfare or, or all of the above. Um, but I feel like people have a lot of drive towards making the right decisions, but the harder those decisions are to execute in their lives, the less likely they are to stick with them. So our mm-hmm. job as an industry, I think, is to make the transition from an animal-centric diet to a plant-based diet a seamless one. That means that these products have to be available in the places where people shop or in the restaurants where they dine. They have to be at attractive and affordable price points. If, they, if it costs twice as much to eat plant-based, then that's going to exclude a lot of people. Um, and finally, these things have to be tasty. They have to be satisfying. They have to work in the recipe that was handed down from somebody's grandmother. Um, I think in an ideal world, people wouldn't notice, nor would they care, whether they were eating a plant-based uh, meat product as opposed to an, a, an animal one. Right. So that kind of brings me to a, a thought here. For the alternative protein show, you have really plant-based and you also have cell-based agriculture. I've noticed that a lot of companies that are, you know, the new kids on the block when it comes to plant-based are trying to approximate what animal protein tastes like, you know, both in texture and taste. Um, You know, what do you think about that Mm -hmm. from your perspective of Tofurky? I know that, like, Tofurky itself was really a stroke of genius because you made a holiday roast that vegetarians could, you know, indulge in. It's like finding a key to the kind of space that is created by the need to celebrate something, but not having a way to do so. So that created a cult following. But now, like you're saying, there's like the fast, the quick, there's the like, you know, impossible burger. There's there's all of these things that are coming to bear. But those are really trying to approximate that, you know, animal meat. Um, Yeah, um, I think watching these emerging kind of higher tech approaches toward solving the same problem that we are is is fascinating. I think um, what we're seeing is that it's creating a lot of interest in the media and I think is creating, you know, that interest in the media is creating a lot of consumer awareness and ultimately consumer demand as well. Um, but some of the technologies that are coming out, they're, they're not, they're not earth shaking quite like, um, you know, potentially cellular agriculture is. I think impossible burger, beyond burger, those are really cool things. Um, and they're, they're drawing the interest of consumers that maybe had given up on the category, and I think they're really tasty and good. Um, but they're not for everybody, and I'm really glad that there are different approaches. You know, Some of us take more of a natural, uh, lo- lesser processed approach. Some, it's really, you know, they're, they're fully invested in more of the high-tech approach. And then finally, we have this kind of uncharted territory with cellular ag- agriculture, um, and that's yet to be tested in the marketplace. Um, I think they have the same challenges that all of us do, but I'm really excited to see how it all shakes out. Ultimately, I want consumers to be satisfied and also not be participating in an animal-based kind of food system because it's so detrimental to our society. Yeah, as a story, this is probably one of the more interesting stories out there that's happening right now with all of these ter- you know technologies emerging and trying to you know, do what they're trying to do with food. And, you know, very few people know about it, which is pretty wild. I mean, the media coverage is, is at, at best, it's, it's talking about, you know, Frankenstein and Frankenfoods and this and that. And it kind of really misses the point, which is that, you know, from, from everything that I've seen, we're trying to solve a really, really big problem which is a huge population growth. And now guess what? we all still need to eat protein. Yeah, yeah, it really is a brave new world out there. Um, You know, the one concern I do have when we talk about and focus more on cellular agriculture is um, to some degree I fear that it gives people an excuse to wait, to wait for that new technology to be out in the consumer marketplace. Um, And I would just sort of suggest that people should avail themselves of what's on the store shelves and restaurant menus already. We've got some really incredible products. We've mentioned a few. Um, We have some great products. I feel like the entire sort of plant-based industry is just full of great 
discoveries for consumers to make. Um, sometimes they have to venture into different parts of the, the grocery store than they're used to. Um, but I think that that's worth the effort to seek these products out. They really can change the way that you eat at home or, or eat out. Right. It's really all about bringing it to the masses. Like you were saying, convenience, price point, taste, texture, all of that is so important. And, you know, a lot of these companies, including yours, are doing something about it, which is great. Um, I was curious, what um, kind of plant-based proteins do you currently use in your products? Well, so a lot of our um, products are sort of developed out of traditional technologies. Um, We use tofu in a lot of our products. That's part of our name, Tofurky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but also we, we depend on, so I mentioned earlier that we're sort of a, a lesser processed, a minimally processed type of a plant-based alternative. The, the way that we're able to do that is we rely on the real unique properties of a protein that sometimes has gotten tarnished um, recently, which is gluten. So wheat protein. Wheat protein has this amazing property of it likes to create polymers. It creates strands and strings of protein, which is very familiar to us because that's um, that's a lot of the the structure of like whole muscle meat that we're so used to as a kind of animal centric um, dietary culture. Um, well, gluten does that by itself more or less. It does that using processing with you know air quotes around it that we all have in our own kitchens. Um, uh, like a stand, a stand mixer, a KitchenAid mixer is really all it takes to make tofurkey. Um, and I think that's huh. great. It's it's nice. It appeals to a, a lot of us who are a little bit suspicious about having too much technology or too many synthetic ingredients in our diets. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's that's sort of like one of the the secrets to tofurkey is really just a long. Um, kind of experience with, um, we've almost developed sort of a, an artistic instinct for how to use gluten in our products, um, rather than relying on kind of those, those higher processing types of, of approaches that, that some of the newer companies are using. Right. Well, it's just like on your website where you say aprons, not lab coats, Mm -hmm. right? Something that you can literally make in a kitchen. So um, that's an interesting expression, I think, and one that truly like speaks to the concerns some people have about the industry. And finding that language is so important. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, food is is such an intimate thing. It's such an intimate part of our lives. It's it's sort of tied up in a lot of kind of our family cultural uh, traditions and whatnot. And I'm not just talking about special occasions. I think that we all have these, you know, amazing conversations over just an average weekday dinner sometimes, too. Um, and I don't know, there's something about making food with your own hands or something about knowing that uh, the people who prepared your food are actually people and not robots and that the people who developed your food are, you know, culinary experts, not scientists. Um, uh, There's Mm. something nice about that. It feels very human. Right. Well, food really does need to feel human. I mean, it also needs to nourish us and it needs to interest us and it needs to be relatable, like kind of all the things that you were just alluding to. Um, But so here's a question and you're going to really pick up on this because I'm definitely not an expert on what I'm going to say here. This is really something I wrote down. So proteins are chains of amino acids. There are 20 amino acids, nine of which cannot be synthesized in the human body and must therefore be consumed in order for us to meet nutritional needs of the body. Plant-based proteins can become the source of this nutritional need, but there are many different kinds of products on the market. I know that back in the 80s, to be a vegetarian and satisfy the nutritional requirements was really a challenge. So now with all these companies popping up, how has it changed that we're able to meet the nutritional requirements? when we're eating plant-based? Well, you know, to some degree, I think that that's a mythological concern. Um, I think vegans, all of us are very used to being asked about um, where we get our protein, often with great concern. I mean, how could we possibly get enough protein without eating meat? Um, The reality is the meat that we're eating as a culture, that huge bowl that became the beef that you're eating, it got that big and that muscular being a vegetarian also. So it's obviously there's protein out there in a plant-based diet. Um, Herbivores get plenty of protein too. I think some studies that I've seen show that even vegetarians in the American culture get more protein than they need. We're a very protein-obsessed culture. That said, it is easy to get a lot of protein in your diet and easier than it has ever been as a vegan because products like tofurkey and others, they're so widely available. 
um, they're they're everywhere. You don't have to be you know in the vicinity of a Whole Foods market in order to buy tofurkey. You can be in the vicinity of any of over four thousand WalMarts now too. That means that you you know it's not just for urban coastal types of people. It's for everybody, and I think that's great and timely because everybody can use more plant-based um, products in their diet, if, if only for their own personal health. And I think a lot of people are getting that message finally. The, you know, the government's dietary guidelines don't emphasize it enough, in my opinion, but this is really something that people can do out of selfish motivations too, because we all want to be healthy, right? We all want to be around a little longer to see our grandkids grow up and things like that. So um, I think it's very democratic now that these things are available to everybody everywhere. Yeah, there's a lot of confusion when it comes to, you know, how much protein you need, for sure. Um, there's, there's confusion about nutrition. There's, there's confusion about diet. The American diet in general is confusion because of all those, you know, contradictory statements even by the FDA. Um, I know that I'm, I feel like I'm health conscious, yet I'm still confused because it's not like when you eat you know, a meal, your body goes ding, 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 ding. You've done all the things that you need to do to be balanced. So it's this kind of ethereal thing where you have sort of a basic understanding. And I try to make sure that I eat what is, what is you know, going to satisfy me nutritionally. But I don't know where there are gaps. And we have all of these things like supplements and vitamins and all these different, you know, ne- neotropics, uh, all, all of these different products to help augment our health. Um, you know, how far, you know, do you dive? How deep do you dive as a company like Tofurky to create new products that kind of speak to that as an issue? Um, yeah, I think it's always part of the conversation. We're very much influenced by the people that reach out to us and their concerns. Um, and you know, a lot of times they, they are expressing concerns about nutrition, but you know, I think ultimately it's easier to satisfy people's nutritional needs, um, as a you know product developer than it is to satisfy their kind of gustatory wants, you know, is this flavorful? Is it juicy? Is the texture what, you know, what I want? That's really where the, the difficulty is. And I think that's where the real, you know, magic happens when you're able to you know, provide something that is tasty and delicious. Just by the nature of how we create textures and whatnot, we tend to have a lot of protein in Tofurky products. Um, so there's no lack of protein there. Um, and I, you know, I think you, you sort of alluded to this also, it's, it's so confusing. It's hard to know as a consumer how to navigate, you know, questions around having the, the best, most nutritious diets. I think even more so if we make the mistake of focusing just on one component of our meal or one meal on, you know, onto itself, because nutrition is something that happens kind of over time. You know, the average of what your diet is like is really going to define how healthy you are or how nutritious your diet is. So, you know, I think this is where I just would recommend that people focus a lot on getting those, uh, you know, vegetables and whole grains and things like that. If you're adding things that are highly concentrated protein sources like tofurkey, then I have no doubt that you're probably meeting your protein needs. It's probably the other things, the micronutrients that I'd be more concerned about. And the great thing about, you know, vegetables or especially like green leafy vegetables is that if you have abundant sources of those in your diets, you're probably checking off all your micronutrient needs as well. We probably don't need to go to the level of, um, you know, multivitamins and things like that if we just really do take to heart this this kind of clarion call that we're all getting as a culture to eat more plants and eat plant-based. Right. So some of it's just consumerism. It's it's kind of wanting more and buying more things with the hope that it's going to affect us, you know, our, both our psyche and our physical, you know, needs. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm a little suspicious of the solution to every problem being to add more, more, more. I mean, it's something different, but it's always something more. Um, and I think the bigger and better health impact you can have is probably less, less, less animal products. We know that they're not healthy for us, and those can be replaced pretty easily with other protein sources that are definitely healthier. Sure. So one of the things I noticed in just looking at some of your products, there's a do-it-yourself and grounds category, right? So the do-it-yourself burger that comes like like almost like hamburger meat in a, in a in the package. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was interesting simply because, um, and I, and as of yet, I I haven't messed around with that, but I intend to. So, 
are you trying to encourage people to look at you know this package of um, vegetable protein and say I can season this myself I can do what I want to do with it it's kind of my you know do it yourself experience so that there's actually a culinary you know avenue for people to relate to yeah I mean it to some degree that's bucking the trend we see people gravitating more towards convenience foods kind of on average but there are definitely a lot of us out there that like to cook and get something out of cooking <coughs> excuse me um, and this is really a product designed for them. Or maybe it's designed for people who are kind of younger and kind of defining for themselves what their their um, kind of eating and, and culinary life is going to be like. I think it's um, really empowering for people to have control over those decisions. You can customize, you know, all the different ingredients that you like or don't like or maybe have allergies to. And the best way to do that is to cook for yourself. So this is a product that's really, you know, made for people who don't know how to replace, you know, that animal protein in the in the, the recipes they've made for a long time, or, or maybe it's for people who are just looking for new recipes to try, and they're not sure, you know, they know that they're they're vegan, that they don't want to eat meat, but you know, how do you adapt all these great recipes that you see out there? Um, and and we're trying to pro provide a simple solution for people in that that uh, situation. Sure. What's your favorite way uh, to you know deal with a do it yourself? I you know with the yeah, with the DIY products, <clears throat> I like to stick with the classics, which is just you know making them into patties and grilling them on the grill. You know, seeing them kind of like the juices come out and drip on the grill, and you get that familiar smell, and you get that nice kind of charred grill, you know, sort of flavor um, and a juicy you know mouthfeel. It's really a great experience. It's really reminiscent. I don't feel like you go to a barbecue and miss out if you've got an option like DIY. Right. Okay. Nice. And um, can you tell us about some of your new products and what you're excited about? Um, yeah. So sort of more recently, we've launched um, some ham products, um, deli slices, uh, more recently a holiday roast with this great um, uh, beer glaze along with it. Um, and up and coming here, we've got the relaunch, the reintroduction of something that was really a consumer favorite. We had Tofurky Pockets on the market for a little bit less than a year. They're really starting to pick up steam and gain traction. We had commitments from major retailers to go national with them, and I think they were going to be a great success. And we certainly heard nothing but good feedback from our consumers. Um, unfortunately, we had kind of a supplier issue, and we've you know, found better um, suppliers, and we're poised now to relaunch those in the new year, and I'm pretty excited about it. Oh, sounds good. I have to keep an eye out for this. <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing something on your Instagram where you made a video that was explaining that, you know, to all of your fans, you were having some issues with uh, getting all, all of the new demands for Tofurky uh, up to snuff when it came to manufacturing. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely been something that our whole industry is, has, you know, faced, which is this massive explosion of consumer demand. Um, we're all doing our best to increase capacity as fast as we can because you know this is why we're here is to to jump in and and fill that demand once um, people get the message and it seems like that's happening. It seems like we're hitting this tipping point in the culture where you know it's not just um, you know this incremental movement but this big kind of you know stair step moment that we're having in in consumer demand now. So it, it caught us all by surprise that it's happening so fast and we're all scrambling to um, build up capacity and, and meet that demand. So how popular are you, let's say, in Asia or Europe? Well, Asia is not really an, an area that we've tackled in a big way yet. But Europe, um, that has been a focus of ours. Um, and all I can say is that the growth there has been incredible. Um, the interest from major retailers um, has been, you know, really noteworthy also. It feels like, to some degree, it's happening even faster in some of these other places like Europe and like Australia, where, you know, I think they were as meat-centric as we have been um, up until very recently, but the shift there has been overnight. Um, and it's great to be, be there and have a brand that people have known more as a, a slice of Americana, a, a bit of American culture, than it as actual products on the shelf and it's great to be able to ship products over there and, and give them a chance to try it it's actually good food not just a funny punchline yeah. right <laughs> <laughs> and just to bring it back to the alt protein show um we were curious what are you guys planning on serving up for people to taste 
I can, I can talk about that. Hi guys, Jamie, you've been doing such a great job jumping in. I've, I've been enjoying listening. Um, so at the Alt Protein Show, we are going to um, be showcasing some of our chicken products, our shredded chicken. Um, and I believe we're going to be um, sampling some ch uh, chicken salad. Um, and so we'll have that for people to sample and taste. And then we'll also have, you know, some of, some other products for people to sort of pick up and um, we'll be happy to talk through any of it, how it's made, what the ingredients are, um, et cetera, et cetera. That chicken salad is phenomenal, by the way. I love it when we show that at trade shows because I sit back there and just munch away on it the whole time. <laughs> Can't wait to try it. <laughs> nice. So I saw that you're working with some local companies to help source your ingredients, such as Hub and Nosa Familia. Yep. And I mean, like, so why? <laughs> so I could, I could speak to that. Um, so one thing that is really important to us is our uh, benefit corporation status. And for those listening who don't know what that means, it's kind of like fair trade, but for the whole business. So we're audited every two years by... Um, the B Corp, B Labs, um, and they come through and they look at our manufacturing pra practices, our employee um, sort of benefits, um, our supply chain status, et cetera, et cetera. And all of the audit um, documentation and our score is made public. So anybody can go online and find out how a B Corp is um, audited, rated, and, um, and then maintains their certification. And um, so it was important to us as we continue to expand our supply chain partnerships to look for other B Corps. And on top of that, when we were looking at product innovation and development, we also wanted to pull in some of our neighbors. I think, um, you know, people who know food um, might know that the Pacific Northwest is um, sort of looked upon as um, an innovation hub in terms of um, plant-based agriculture and um, sort of like foodie, a foodie scene in general. So Hopworks Urban Brewery, they are, um, they're a large microbrewery, they're in Portland, so an hour um, west of us, and they're also a B Corp. So um, we just approached them and said, hey, we're really looking to do something super cool with this new ham product that we are launching. Um, you know, can we, uh, uh, come in, do a tasting. Would you like to be part of a partnership? And they were super stoked on it. And it's really fun to kind of um, collaborate, um, innovate, and then and then co-brand things to help draw audiences from both sides of sort of the the food landscape. And then um, that was such such a successful partnership that we also looked to incorporate another B Corp um, and local uh, food manufacturer in our backyard by the name of Nosa Familia, and they um, are coffee roasters. And we included their decaf espresso um, as a primary or key ingredient in a new uh, vegan chocolate espresso cheesecake that we launched in our holiday feast kits this Christmas. Yeah, I've noticed that those grow like you, first you had roasts, then you have kits, and then you have gravy, and you have, you've just grown that into this huge thing. And now the desserts. <laughs> yeah, it's super cool. It's, it's super fun to sort of innovate within an existing product category. So for people who pick up the feast kits over the holiday season, um, I think that um, we've positioned an expectation within a loyal consumer group that there will be new items every few years. So formerly there were there was um, a chocolate cake or a chocolate brownie, and this year we've introduced a vegan uh, chocolate espresso cheesecake. Um, it's unconventional in nature because one might assume that a cheesecake would be made of dairy uh, products. Um, but uh, our R&D team has really outdone themselves um, with this cheesecake. We have had phenomenal feedback on it. And, and it's also been a real pleasure to work with uh, Nosa Familia and, um, and kind of, um, you know, sort of build energy together over the launch of that item. Um, and so I would just say that we'll be looking to partner with other um, B Corp and local uh, suppliers and brands in the future. It just feels really energetic. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Nice. And I noticed too that, um, you know, you guys are a founding member of the Plant Based Association. 
and um, just wondering what the association is really doing, you know, to contribute to the growth of the of plant based protein. Right. So the Plant Based Foods Association, I think we've been around for about four years now. So Tofur- Tofurky was one of the founding kind of member companies. There were about five of us who started it, um, and we're all very active to this day. Um, Really what the Plant-Based Foods Association is all about is kind of advocating for us as an industry. You know, it's not, I think that people might have looked at our industry a few years ago and and just assumed that it was a bunch of hippies, um, you know, that really had no bigger ambitions than selling a little bit of product at Whole Foods. I mean, the reality is this is a big business and it's a growing business. If you follow the, you know, the business news, you know that massive amounts of money are being invested in this space right now. It is a legitimate profit-seeking capitalistic sort of endeavor at the same time that for some of us, it's a an expression of mission and virtues and, and values. Um, but what the PBFA does is talks to the FDA about issues around what can you call your products. It engages um, with members of Congress and lobbying in terms of like elements of the farm bill. Um, it creates retailer programs to encourage sort of more of a focus um, on plant-based products in grocery stores and to help educate those retailers also about the potential and the massive growth that's happening in the plant-based space as opposed to the conventional grocery space. So really it's, it's there just to be an advocate for the industry in general. Um, and you know, it's really caught on. It's great to see that, um, even at the, as a trade group, that there's a lot of consumer interest, um, because for a lot of people, you know, this issue of getting more plant-based products out there, it's not, it's not just commerce. It's, it's also kind of their personal missions as well. Um, so it's, it's really cool to have a trade group, have that direct consumer interest and support as well. Sure. So that kind of makes me think when I go into my local grocery store and I'm looking for food, the first aisle you normally go into when you're in a store is the produce aisle. That's where they kind of position you first. Now, I've seen Tofurky products mainly, at least at my grocery store, are within the auspices of the produce section, which isn't a bad thing at all. But my question is, things are changing to the degree that now we might be able to look at alternative proteins as well as plant-based specifically as occupying a different space within the grocery store so that people think about them differently. It's kind of like everyone goes down the meat aisle and thinks, oh, I'm going to get the bigger part of my meal, but it's really not necessarily the case when we have all these great products coming out and some of which have been around for a long time, frankly. Do you ever find yourself lobbying to affect that in any way or at least within your marketing efforts? I think it's great that you're seeing that problem or that potential even as just a consumer. Um, I think you really hit it on the head. Not everybody spends as much time in the produce section as some of us do. And not all of us, um, while we're in the produce section, are thinking about where the kind of concentrated protein part of our diet is going to come from. That Those decisions happen in the meat aisle for a lot of people. Um, And I think there's a real potential here for us as an industry to get our products in front of people who don't that don't really know about them don't really think about them when it really matters which is at that moment of you know kind of purchase decision so what you described is definitely an ongoing effort of the plant-based foods association we're trying to develop a you know, kind of a white paper approach where we kind of prove where the best place and what the best way is to merchandise plant-based products with the hope that once this is known and quantified, that the whole industry can be influenced by it. Um, you know, it's a big decision. It takes a lot of manpower um, to move a section of a grocery store. Um, so I think retailers are rightly waiting to see that that's you know definitely going to pay dividends for them. And I think this is a place where a trade group like the PBFA can really um, inform that conversation and help to. Um, help everybody make the right decision with the end goal being that the retailers benefit because they sell more plant-based products. Um, The consumers benefit because they're exposed to more plant-based products. And of course the manufacturers like us benefit because we're selling more products as well. Hopefully in that migration, there's also some consideration of just increasing the size of the plant-based set. I think a real problem is that 
there's such a limited amount of real estate on store shelves that's devoted to this category right now. It's growing so fast. It's got so many new cool products coming on the market. Um, consumers deserve more access to all of that interesting stuff that's happening. And hopefully they're seeing the potential. They're having these conversations internally now and they're making commitments to increase the size of that set. It, it's it's going to pay off for everybody. I, I'm pretty certain of that. Yeah, I think you're right. If you look at the efforts that have been going on for what's been happening in beverages, you know, there's been so much innovation in beverages and there's, you know, grocery stores and stores that are having even end caps dedicated to new products coming in. I think grocery stores need to kind of look at it that way in terms of, you know, the tried and true and then the, the, the companies that are coming up with some new things or new things to try and kind of putting it in the consumer's face so that they can make a decision that they want to try it the, the worst thing is is when it's hiding you know that's something that obviously is is you know going to be worked on and it's good that you have a lobby to affect change because it needs to happen clearly mm -hmm. yeah i agree agreed there's already sections for organic or gluten-free items i mean it'd be great to see a plant-based section in a store in the future mm -hmm. so yeah. out of curiosity um what advice would you give to an aspiring plant-based entrepreneur? Oh, wow. Um, that's a great question. Um, and, <laughs> and actually, I should point out that's another thing that the, the Plant-Based Foods Association is doing. It's a great opportunity for um, you know up-and-coming entrepreneurs in the space to get some mentorship as well. We actually have a formal program where some of the kind of the, the old guard who have been in this industry for a while, we sign up and we mentor um, people who ask for, for help um, and they might come with different types of questions. Maybe they're more marketing related. Maybe they're kind of about the nuts and bolts of how you get products through, um, through distributors to the store shelves and all, but it, it's such a, it's a, a great inspiring thing that gives me a lot of energy too, is to tap into their enthusiasm. This is all brand new to them and they almost to a person I think are coming into this with the same motivations that we have, you know, having been here for a long time, we're all about affecting change in the world. And I think that that is, is kind of the, in the DNA of a lot of the entrepreneurial efforts that I'm seeing right now. So it's great to be able to pass along some of the lessons that we've learned the hard way. We've certainly made a lot of mistakes over the years and uh, we can help prevent others from making those mistakes, uh, hopefully through things like this mentorship, this formal mentorship relationship but I should also say that it's such a friendly industry. Um, we're all kind of, you know, heading for the same goal. And it's growing so fast that I don't think we have the normal concerns about, you know, getting market share from each other. It seems very collaborative. And, you know, beyond just the formal programs like the mentorship program, there's a lot of informal information sharing and, you know, relationships that, that really make it a special place to be in business and in, you know, quote unquote competition with um, a bunch of decent people. Sure. The other thing that I might say for new folks getting into this industry is, you know, one might assume that they've got a product that is unique, um, that they feel has a, a, you know, a point of differentiation on the market. But the way that they're really going to reach consumers and create um, sort of equity with retail partners is if that product or that brand has an authentic story. Does it have a reason for being and is that relatable to consumers? Um, because the product space or our category is getting more crowded and um, there really has to be a defining or differentiating um, sort of story associated with that brand for consumers to um, sort of spend time and money exploring it. Right. Absolutely. There's something beautiful about authenticity. And especially when you have to work with someone that's authentic and their, you know, their innovation is authentic and it's coming from a great place mm -hmm. from the perspective of what we do, which is branding. That's kind of why we got involved with the Alternative Protein Show, because we are looking, seeking out to work with companies that have innovations that are affecting change in, you know, ways that excite us mm -hmm. and it's such an opportunity um, to, to really kind of help um, tell a story um, and explain that story quickly 
and also to have the luxury of you know multimedia websites digital to take it to the next level and have layers of things that really resonate with people and that come from authenticity so that's kind of our objective i think i think that authenticity is also you know kind of Aaron talked about us trying to work with other B Corps. It's such a privilege to, you know, find other people that are, you know, in similar situations or running companies and maybe they're in slightly different industries, but that they come, that they approach the problems and challenges in the same way that, that we do, that they're very human about it, that they can relate to people just as people, not, you know, not as clients and customers and whatnot. Um, I've been really, yeah, I've been really glad to, to kind of find that here. You know, part of what I liked about science was this authentic kind of pursuit for knowledge, like you're all going after the same thing. I, I'm finding that different flavors of that, you know, within the plant-based industry, I think there's a lot of sort of, you know, shared values. But even within that B Corp community, there are other types of values that are also shared that really resonate and are kind of fundamental to our company and fundamental to you know me as a person too and so it's it's great to connect with people on a human level and then have these great relationships kind of yield collaborations that resonate in the consumer marketplace too and you make good products together that's that's a really magical experience right it's one big network really um when it comes down to it and you know being involved with the alt protein show has definitely given us the opportunity to to meet a lot of these different companies and to alex's point you know we like to help a lot of these startups who maybe don't know what first step to take they have a great product but how do i get it out there what do i do with this now so i feel like it's a good way for us to kind of like get involved as well Mm -hmm. and you know, the show itself will definitely provide a lot of networking opportunities for companies such as yourselves as well to meet other companies in this space. So definitely think it's going to be, you know, a great opportunity. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, we're looking forward to, to actually uh, putting a uh, face to uh, to the voice. So, mm-hmm. you know, we're going to see you in San Francisco. Right. You're, are you both, you're both going to be there, right? I will not be attending. Um, so our marketing, a couple of our marketing team members will be there, and then Jamie and our VP of R and D. All right. Well, although not having you there <laughs> is not exactly what I was looking for, but that's okay. We'll meet you down the line. <laughs> but we'll see you, Jamie, yeah. and you know we're looking forward to it. Um, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Once again, this has been Alex and Diana from Brand First speaking with Jamie Athos and Aaron Ransom of Tofurky. It's definitely a learning process. All of this new food and technology is going to come to San Francisco on the 16th of January. We hope to see everyone there. Yes, and if you'd like more information, visit altprotein.com. Dot show, or you can also visit our website at brandfirstnj.com. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody.